Hi everyone, thank you for coming to the presentation today um, on Azure Synapse Analytics for Cloud Professional. This is a two-part series um, on Azure Synapse, and in this session we will talk about how to use Azure Synapse uh, for data exploration. Um, so before we dive in, um, a quick bio about myself. Um, my name is Wilson Mock. Um, I have over 15 years of experience in IT uh, doing software development prior to moving to the data space. Uh, I worked um, as a lead data architect at CAE, where my focus was to create data product to transform the business, to um, use data to make better decisions. Uh, before that, I worked at Air Canada as a lead AI architect, uh, where we created data and AI product to optimize flight capacity and different pricing models. Uh, lastly, I worked at, um, as a data engineer before at Enbridge as well, uh, where uh, I helped create an AI product to help with the maintenance of the uh, wind farm. If you'd like to follow me, um, I can be found on LinkedIn, C Sharp Corner, and GitHub at uh, slash Wilson dash mark. Right, so in this presentation today, um, we, ex we uh, I want to make sure the um, the audience here have a fundamental understanding of SQL and and Python, um, and I would uh, I would recommend you visit the Dear Azure YouTube channel uh, as it has great tutorial on um, some of the topics um, fundamental topics we cover here today. Uh, that that's in the channel today. Um, so in this session, we'll be focusing on um, data exploration using Azure Synapse Analytics. We'll be covering the steps we will take to analyze a new data set using serverless SQL and serverless Spark. In this presentation, um, has two uh, demos. After the first demo, we will have a quick five minute uh, Q&A session and followed by a longer Q&A session at the end of the presentation. All the code you see um, in the demo today will be available uh, on my GitHub repository as well. All right, so what is um, Synapse Analytic? Synapse Analytic is an all-in-one suite uh, solution for data exploration, data integration, and data warehousing. Um, so what is um, data exploration? Um, data, in data exploration, we focus is to bring um, data into Synapse so we can evaluate if the data is useful for our um, business requirement or business analysis. Um, we can do this either using SQL um, or and or using Apache um, Spark. Synapse Analytics provides a serverless SQL and a serverless Spark to simplify the compute scaling and on-demand usage. Uh, we will we'll be doing a deeper dive into um, data exploration in the upcoming slides, um, and we'll go into more detail what is a serverless and um, SQL and serverless Spark in uh, in a few moments as well. In the data integration, um, this is um, where we use to build our data pipeline where we can help doing extracted data from either our internal system or external system. We can load the data into our data lake and as well as transform the data into um, a data warehouse, uh, for example. Uh, we did a two part series on um, Azure Data Factory, which is very uh, similar to the Synapse uh, integration. Uh, so please check that out again on um, the Azure YouTube channel uh, on the previous recordings. Finally, um, the last component of uh, Synapse Analytics is the data warehousing. Um, so this is where we would create um, a data model for reporting, reporting purposes and provide the main benefits of the data model um, for data warehousing is to provide um, historical records and, and tracking of any ch data changes that um, that we have over time. Now, as I hinted earlier in this session, we'll focus on um, on the data exploration portion. So how do we conduct a data exploration um, when we're given a new data source? So let's So let's take a look at how um, where data um, uh, applies to 
where a scenario where Azure Synapse Analytics applies very well. So imagine you're a part of a, um, a team working to optimize the New York taxi service. And this new data source uh, is for a project and you're assigned on, 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 on to doing as part of the team and you're assigned to work on this data. So since this new data source, um, this is a new data source for, for you and the team, um, we have to start with data exploration. So we have four major steps to achieve. Uh, the, main, the first step is we need to first obtain the data. We need to understand the data. We need to assess the quality of the data and report our finding on the, um, on the insight as well. So let's see how we could use um, Synapse Analytics to achieve each of the each of the steps. So, um, so as we talked about, we need to um, obtain the data as a first step. So, in data exploration uh, at the initial phase, is very is very common that we retrieve the data manually. So this might be downloading the data from the public website. Um, in this case, like the New York taxi data that's uh, made available, or this could be even the um, the client or the customer sending you their a sample of the extracted data. Um, so in in any case, after you receive that data uh, or you extract the data, we have to upload this data into our storage so we can um, conduct our analysis. So the next step we need to do is now um, we need to understand our data. So this is broken into sub two sub components. The first is to really building our understanding, our technical understanding of the data. So um, what does this mean? This means um, what is the data? What is the data format that we receive? Is it a CSV file? Is it a Parquet file? Is it a JSON file? And how are the data being structured? So if it's a, a JSON, for example, is it going to be a nested structure versus um, a Park um, a CSV file where it's more more uh, tabular data? Um, we also want to learn about things like the data column, the column type, the column name. Um, is you know uh, a column is the is it coming in as a string even though you store as a number uh, or it's showing as a number? Um, or do we have any technical constraints like primary key, foreign key, and uh, unique constraints and so forth? So the second component will be for the uh, understanding the context or the contextual of the data. So how do we interpret the data? Um, so for example, does the taxi fare that we will see in a second um, in our demo, um, does the fare amounts contain taxes or is there a a separate column that contains the, the total, for example. Um, and also we need to be cognizant of the unit of measure that we have. Um, <clears throat> in the United States, the distance is measured in miles, um, where you know where I am in Canada, they, they're measured in kilometers. So that would dramatically impact, um, that could dramatically impact our analysis as we uh, try to derive insights for the business. Uh, On to the third step, after we finally understanding the data that we have, we need to assess the quality of the data. So um, this could mean that we need to run validations and checks to make sure um, any columns of data that we have actually making sense. Um, and we might be doing bins and max check, for example, um, any um, unique field or any um, uh, primary key columns, we need to make sure there is no uh, duplicates or there is no nulls, for example. Um, and we also need to identify and understand any columns that have uh, dependencies with each other. Uh, for example, if we have um, six passengers um, in a trip, uh, the vehicle most likely will have to be a van. If it's if it's a, a car or, or normal sedan, then we, we're going to have some issues there. Um, and for the data that doesn't end up meeting our data quality checks, we will have to reject those uh, those roles. So um, this will this will help protect our analysis to ensure our analysis is valid, and our data is not being skewed by any uh, invalid data. And finally, we need to find a way to summarize our data so that we can create a report for our um, 
our business owner or, or uh, the business team that asked us to do this analysis. So um, this can take the form of either creating very simple basic charts um, or making the data available so that we can create a Power BI report, which is uh, contains a more sophisticated or uh, better better reporting. Um, you know, as part of the, um, the analysis, we might create different views or even additional tables to help with um, the reporting aspect as well. So let's quickly talk about serverless SQL. Uh, as we mentioned, talked about earlier, how we going to do um, data exploration. So Azure Synapse is um, provides serverless SQL, which is similar to the traditional SQL. So just like the traditional SQL, we can query the data using um, select statements and we can create views and tables. The main difference is <clears throat> we are reading and writing the data um, from our um, from our um, data lake uh, or the, the storage account. Uh, and because of that, when we create a table, uh, we call it the external table because the um, the table itself doesn't get stored in inside uh, Synapse itself. Um, and the, one of the primary benefit of uh, serverless SQL is that we have, um, it's a pay as you go model. So you only pay um, for the compute usage um, when you're actually executing the query. Um, you don't have to pay for <clears throat> the um, the SQL to be running 24-7. So in our first demo, we will go through this, um, this process of the data exploration um, in our demos. And we will first create, as I mentioned earlier, we'll create the external table based on the, the New York taxi data that we have in our data lake. We will uh, build some queries in SQL so we can better understanding our data in both technically and as well as um, contextually on our um, base for our analysis. And then we will use the SQL to also check for things like um, uh, nulls, max, and mins for <clears throat> some of the uh, more interesting columns like the trip pickup time, drop off time, um, passenger count, and and fare amount. And you once you see the data in a second, you um, you will kind of make a lot more sense why we need to do that. <clears throat> and then based on our our, our analysis, we will be uh, as well filtering those data out, right? As I mentioned earlier. And finally, we'll be building um, uh, a view that we can show the average number of passenger and the number average of trips uh, for each days of the week. Okay, so we'll switch over to the demo here. Right, okay. So in here, this is the Synapse workspace. And um, so we need to click on the open this, uh, open Synapse Studio so that we can uh, actually go into the workspace environment and, and do our development there. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's very common for us to uh, retrieve the data at the really early initial stage of the data exploration. We might be getting a sample data or we might be getting, um, um, you know, a, a public access data. So we need to go get that data. So um, and in in Synapse workspace, we can do everything within Synapse itself. So we can go into the, the data tab. Under the link, uh, we will be able to see our uh, storage account. So in here, we'll go um, going to access our data storage. Uh, and this file I uploaded um, before the presentation, uh, but here it is capability to definitely upload the data directly or if you're familiar with the uh, Azure Storage Explorer, you can upload the data up, uh, from that point of view as well. Okay. So um, after we have the data uploaded and being available, we can simply right click here uh, under new SQL script. We can select the top 100 rows. And what this though does is it creates an um, auto generated code from um, uh, by Synapse. And we can just run this code really quickly and um, it will grab us the top 100 rows 
um, and as you can see, the syntax is slightly different than what we have in uh, traditional SQL. So in this case, we are we are actually opening a rule set. We're saying that um, we need to grab this file from our um, storage account, and this file is a parquet format. And we'll run the um, this command as a result, and we'll do a select from it. So um, yeah, so. So as you can see that um, when I, uh, once we generate this code, we, we click the run, it, the query returns relatively quickly. And again, this is the power of serverless SQL. So I did not have to pay for um, my Synapse um, uh, SQL compute running all day, uh, only when I ran that four second, when this, um, when this um, query is, uh, I have to pay for this query, okay? Uh, so let's review the query results that we have. Um, as our goal is to build some, um, build both the technical and the contextual understanding of the data. So we'll um, we'll first look at the pickup date and the um, <clears throat> as well as the job update. So those are the kind of the second and the third columns that we have. Um, and as we can see, this is a, a timestamp, or it could be a daytime to format we're, we're not too sure at the moment as there's no way for us to um, select the data type which we can do in a in once in a few seconds here the next thing we see here we see passenger count um, numerical value that's great um, our trip distance is probably uh, some kind of decimal value as we would uh, see here um, and as we scroll over we can see that the um, location information all seems to be null. Um, so that's something to note as we won't be able to derive, um, you know, the, the travel, exact travel um, um, routing that, that was taken, I guess. And as we mentioned earlier, there is the fair amount. So again, this is um, a decimal number. Um, we have things like tips amount, total amount if you have to pay for a toll, and then we also have the total amounts here. So there's a few different um, dollar amounts column that we can look into in our analysis uh, if it required. Okay. So, um, so this, you know, if we run this query today, you'll be kind of cumbersome for us to um, continue to, you know, have to type this out in, in our query. So, um, the first thing I would do in this case, I would create an external table uh, with this data. So let's go back to the data tab. Let's um, close and discard the change on this. And go to create, uh, go to new SQL script and then go create um, uh, external table. Now in here, um, Azure Synapse provides a, a quick GUI or, or um, UI for us to uh, create the external table, and this wizard will quickly um, generate our SQL scripts in a second. So, for us, um, you know, I like to make sure all my um, <clears throat> all my uh, external table is created in a database, um, so it doesn't left in the you know the default schema um, or the default database. In this case, we'll call it the data exploration DB. And then the next thing we'll do is we will um, also create, uh, use a schema called source data. As you saw earlier the, um, in, the, in the storage, that this file is in the source data. So <clears throat> I just want to able to separate what data that is, um, that are source data uh, and keep them separate from any analysis I would be doing. Uh, so this case, you know, I don't, um, I have a good way of managing all the, um, all, all, the uh, all the data that I have. So you can either run automatically or we'll use the, the SQL script. So in this case, we'll select the using the SQL scripts because we want to know um, the command that gets run, right? So, um, so we don't have to always go through the wizard. So we'll click OK on that. <clears throat> okay, so as you can see here, um, our database is created on the top here. As you can see, uh, the use database is automatically selected. And in this script, um, 
we have a few uh, housekeeping items that take place. So as I mentioned earlier, the file that I have, it's a Parquet file. So Synapse want us to create a, an external format called um, Parquet of the file type um, so that you know we can just use the um, the format name instead of uh, always typing the, the command with uh, file type equals Parquet. Uh, similarly, for the uh, storage data source, we will do exactly the same thing. Instead of <clears throat> always have to type in the location, we can just refer by the um, by the data source name. Okay. Now, um, as you saw earlier in the wizard, we wanted to have a schema for our um, external table, but it seems like the um, the code generation wasn't quite perfect, so it's missing a few bits and pieces here. So I'm just going to paste in uh, a quick modification of the code to make sure we create the schema first, and then we give the, um, the our external table uh, uh, a schema name as well. OK, so we'll run the first part of this code. <clears throat> Should be relatively quick, no error message, nothing. Perfect. And then we'll run the code, which um, is the external table that uh, we specify. Now we pass in the data source and the format itself. And this will create our external table. Perfect. And finally, we will um, do the similar query as you saw earlier, select the top 100 from now the, um, the external table that we created. Okay. As you can see here, the, um, <clears throat> the results are, are the same as what we saw earlier. So looks like we're in business in terms of um, able to refer to this table as um, source data dot uh, NYC yellow taxi you know, 2019 January data. Perfect. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to save the file. Uh, but before we save, let's give it a name instead of a, a SQL script one. So I'm going to call this the create SQL uh new york trip yellow yellow taxi uh 2019 january data because that's the um that was the um the data set that we have so we can click on the publish all button up here um and if we if you attended the um azure data factory <clears throat> um sessions before um this is very familiar after you um this is how we um store our data pipeline for example so we could give this a second to publish. Uh, OK, so now this has been published and you can see this. Um, <clears throat> and before we switch to take a look at the code where it is being stored, um, let's go back to the to the workspace tab for a second. And we will use the, the refresh button on the top right. Um, this will kind of refresh this data panel as well. Now you can see our SQL database is now um, appears and let's take a look at what's inside. So we have our data exploration database like we talked about and then the external table that we created. <clears throat> now, uh, as I mentioned before, we didn't quite know what the uh, the data type of the data are when we initially did the um, did our select statement with the storage account, but now um, we can see it either in the create table scripts here or you know also list all the columns information in here. Okay. So um, it'll be easier for you know it'll be much easier in the future that we can kind of figure out what the uh, what the imply column types are um, that was stored in the parquet file. Okay. So uh, so let's close up those tabs uh, really quickly, and then let's go into the develop. So develop is where we will see all of our scripts, um, and that's both the SQL scripts and as well as the Spark scripts that we have. So I have laid out a few scripts that we have in here. So um, as you saw earlier, there's this create SQL um, NYC trip script that we created, and it's being saved under the, the SQL script. Um, and the next script uh, we will look into is how it's now going to focus on um, doing the data um, the data validation. So we want to see, um, you know, if there's any columns that are that are null, for example, like we talked about earlier, um, some max and min checks, for example. 
So um, again, all these codes are available in the in the GitHub uh, repository that I have. So we don't uh, don't worry about um, uh, you can access it from there. Don't worry about you know copying writing this code down. So we're gonna run this query really quickly. So we're gonna check in this query to see if there's any nodes in some of the interesting column that we're we're focusing on. So we want to make sure the, the pickup time, the drop off time, uh, passenger count, uh, trip distance, fair amounts or total amounts there. There's anything that's null. So um, so we got back nothing is is null. So that's good as those will be um, key information for us. Now, if we want to examine further on both the um, passenger count and as well as the fair amount, we want to definitely make sure what is the min and the max amount for um, for each of the variables we have here. So we'll run the passenger count first. So we have zero passenger to nine passenger per trip. Um, it's interesting that we have zero passenger for the trip. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, but nine seems to it's possible, I guess, if you know a larger vehicle like a minivan, for example. And now let's do the same same check on the uh, fair amount. Um, this doesn't seem quite right. We have um, the minimum for fair amounts is negative dollar, and then we have some gigantic, like over half a million value for the uh, maximum fair amount. So uh, I would definitely dive into the fair amounts to try to better understand why is there a negative um fair and then there's also a, a very large sum of a of a fair amount okay so um let's do some reasonable guess right um so in this case um let's say i don't think anybody would be paying for a taxi ride that's more than a thousand dollars and you know at the minimum they probably would be paying for a dollar right this is just um uh, an educated guess, right? Uh, on the taxi ride, we don't, we haven't really deep dive into any of the fair amount of information. So, um, so let's take a look to see what the um, with this um, constraint that we're going to apply. Let's see what is the average uh, passenger count um, that we have uh, for each day of the week, and as well as what is the average trip that we have for each day of the week. Um, I'm making an assumption that there is four weeks in um, in a month uh, on average, uh, especially in January. So, so this query will take a little bit longer to run. All right, so we can see um, there's the average passenger per day day of the week doesn't change much um, throughout the whole month of January. Um, but there is definitely some high and some low on the average um, <clears throat> trips uh, per day of the week. So in Azure Synapse, we have the capability to use the charting function. Um, this is the, um, uh, a more basic charting function. Uh, definitely, again, in Power BI, we can do a more, much more richer um, uh, variable, uh, display uh, or, or graph that we have. So in my case, we're just going to pick a line graph. Um, we want to make sure we show day of the week as the column. And then for the legends, we want to see the two average values that we have. As we can see here, uh, again, all the um, passenger count or uh, average passenger counts are about the same through all the, the days of the week. But Thursdays or oh, Wednesday, Wednesday seems to have uh, actually, Thursday has a higher value, just a little bit, um, beating a Wednesday by about 10K of uh, average um, um, average trip. So, um, so yeah, so there's definitely on Thursday and Wednesday uh, two of the highest um, demand for, for taxi um, in uh, New York City. All right. So, um, so we'll show one last thing. Um, so uh, like I mentioned before, um, we want to make sure we <clears throat> create the analysis that we can use for, um, for our reporting back to 
back to the, 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 the team or the business area that asks us to do this analysis. So um, it is important that we, we um, create um, some of our output ahead of time instead of um, you know, run this select statement every time. Now our select statement didn't take long to run, it took four seconds, uh, but in some cases when we're working in much larger data set, uh, we definitely will want to create um, an external table based on a select statement. And um, or in uh, SQL Server terms, the, the CT, CTAS, um, create table a select um, command. So um, again, in serverless um, SQL, uh, it's the same, except in this case, we use the command external table instead of a create table. Um, again, we provide a data source, the format, um, and also we need to provide a location in this case, as this data will be stored in um, in this particular location, as serverless SQL do not um, store any data in in the um, in the SQL um, storage itself. So we'll run this command to um, to store this query into the external table and we'll run the select statements to uh, verify that the external table has been created. So, and we seems to um, have the same results there. Okay. So um, as an alternative uh, of creating external table, as, as I mentioned earlier, if the query comes back relatively fast, we can also create a, a um, create a view instead of external table, and creating a view will not require us to provide um, this information within the the width bracket um, here. Um, so it will be a same uh, structure as the traditional SQL command. Okay. Okay. So that is the first part of the demo. I see a few questions that we have, so let's take a look here. Um, Beside, beside predictive analysis on the data warehouse and serverless compute. Um, so I don't know if uh, the first question is um, beside predictive analytics on data warehouse and serverless computing, what are the main benefits of um, Synapse? If is the case that Microsoft wants to replace Databricks going ahead with Synapse. So. Um, I'm not sure if um, Microsoft is trying to replace um, Databricks, uh, uh, replace Synapse with Databricks. Um, they are competing products, but they each have their own uh, benefits. Um, so um, Databricks has a much richer uh, machine learning component um, compared to Synapse um, uh, today. So uh, that's definitely one thing that um, Databricks has. Uh, but another thing is um, in Databricks, um, the data warehousing support is uh, being built out at the moment with Proton, um, but definitely in our later sessions, uh, next session, we'll talk about data warehousing using uh, Azure Synapse, which will give you a much, um, you know, much established product on, on that area. Um, serverless compute, it's, you know, it's relatively important because um, as we know that in, in through a demo, by creating external tables, um, a lot of the business users are not um, the best with um, Spark or PySpark and, um, and uh, Spark SQL sometimes has its limitation as well. So by creating the external tables that we have, um, it actually gives the um, business user a lot easier for them to do data exploration with, um, and it can help us uh, or help the company as well to innovate faster. Um, okay, hopefully I answered that question there, uh, Ajat. Um, so the second question we have here is, is that Kusto query language? No, so this is not Kusto, uh, not KQL or Kusto language. Um, that's a separate um, uh, language that we have. So we. What we saw here is um, SQL um, or serverless SQL, and then in a bit here we will see some PySpark as well. Okay, uh, is there any uh, live questions um, that you guys have? Hey, hi Wilson, this is Ajit. 
I just want to know, just as you mentioned, this is serverless part. So, uh, I mean, we do have serverless functions also, right? Serverless is like, you know, based on the trigger, some events. So here uh, is there concept of any events also in case if we want to, you know, execute some ad hoc queries. Um, how, so I'm a little bit confused with the question, sorry. Um, so there is event support, um, and but that's more through um, data integration. So similar to Azure Data Factory. Um, to run ad hoc queries, um, usually that's, um, um, that's not done through, that usually requires some kind of orchestrations, I guess. Um, so in Databricks, we can set up a, a, a job to do it, for example. Um, and in Synapse, we can use the data integration, uh, which is very similar to ADF, to set up a, um, a schedule to run ad hoc queries if that's needed. Okay, okay, I got it. So there's the same. So the same thing which we are doing in the Azure Data Factory. I mean, that's Data Factory itself is based in the Synapse. So uh, there are distinct there are um, distinct differences. Um, so I'm just gonna take a look here quickly. I don't have anything in here, but this is very much um, similar to um, Azure Data Factory. There are specific Synapse components in here that's not existing in Data Factory, and there are certain limitations between uh, the two products today. Um, I believe Microsoft is trying to close the gap between the two products. Um, but um, I don't know the roadmap uh, for that. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? We'll take one more question, see if you guys have any, and then we'll move on to the second part. Okay, great. So uh, let's continue to the second piece. So, um, now, um, in the serverless SQL demo, um, we cleaned our data based on just a simple max and min analysis, um, and that might that might work well um, in some of the cases that we have. Um, but now, oops! Now you imagine that we need to do um, more analysis on detecting data points that are kind of outside of the norm. So um, this is where the bell curve or the standard distribution um, comes in. So in this graph, um, I have highlighted the outliers on the left and the right side of the graph. Um, so the graph represents the number of data, the data points that we have today. Um, so uh, for each side of the graph, the outliers are um, 0.15% of the data points, so total of 0.3% uh, of the data. And um, this also means that 99.7% of our data is within uh, what we call the norm, or you know the the three um, the three uh, standard deviations. So um, it's important to point out that the outliers that we identify doesn't always mean it's bad data. It's just not falling within the norm of data that we have, and we should investigate further uh, to ensure the the data is accurate. Right, just because. Um, we might have six passenger on a in a in a minivan. That doesn't mean, uh, and you know, we don't people don't take minivan very often with six passenger. That doesn't mean that the the data is bad. It just means uh, it doesn't happen very often. So we need to make sure that we uh, investigate those um, those data uh, accordingly. So um, with serverless Spark. We have the ability to um, use Apache Spark to process our data, and as we know, um, Spark is great at processing large amount of files in um, our large amount of data in, in files. So um, Spark can process can scale the process of the data um, in by using multiple um, VMs. Uh, we call them a cluster. Uh, it supports multiple programming language, so it supports uh, PySpark, um, Scalar, .NET Spark, and as well as um, Spark SQL. Um, a large amount of uh, a large library support also uh, give us additional capability or functionality in inside Spark. Um, so we can we'll take a look at some of the libraries we 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 added in our uh, demo in a few moments there. And finally, similar to uh, Serverless SQL. Um, Serverless Spark it's also uh, uses the pay-as-you-go model, 
um, we do we pay for the um, the cluster uptime. Um, so the cluster uptime is essentially how long the server will uh, will wait until um, until it times out, and then when the timeout window hits, then the cluster will shut down. So it does it doesn't it definitely does cost a little more um, in terms of uh, idle time. So uh, as I mentioned in our next demo, we're going to use uh, server Spark uh, and more specifically uh, PySpark to accomplish our data exploration. Um, so since our data is already uploaded to the um, to the data to our, to our data lake, we're going to create the data frame to uh, access this, access this data directly. We will load this data into um, into the compute memory called data frame. Um, and then we will do the similar technical and contextual analysis. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll be um, in some of the technical analysis, we'll, we'll get into the normal distribution. Um, and then we'll, fig we'll determine what data makes sense to us uh, and what doesn't. And then we will um, generate or create a, a lake database, um, which um, the user can uh, um can access through the um through the spark sequels uh serverless sequel as well okay so okay so let's uh swap over to the demo here so i have already um got the cluster up and running uh, it does take a few minutes to to start up um so uh, i had it running already um, so the first thing I would do, I'm just going to run all the blocks. So some blocks take longer than others. Um, that will kind of give us a little more time to to chat about the um, the script itself. Okay. So um, as I said earlier, this is a data framework we're reading into. We're reading it from the um, storage account that we saw earlier in the uh, Parquet format. Uh, now it is possible to um, generate this this command here um, and I'll show you guys quickly how we do that so under uh, data link uh, just like before we'll go back to the um, to the data container that contains the source data okay oops so in here we can actually select new notebook low into the data frame so this is the exact same command that I that I have um, uh, that you saw in the in the notebook here, so I can run this command, or you know, I just have it right here. So I'm just gonna run through this notebook. Um, so first thing, you know, the result, we're only selecting ten rows, so no, not much difference than what we saw earlier. Um, instead of null, we see undefined, which is the same representation in PySpark as uh, as nulls. Um, you know, we we're not seeing much issue. Everything. Kind of share the similar similar results as the um, serverless. Now, uh, in the second command here, we can look at the different data type directly um, in the data frame. So we didn't have to create um, an external table to see that. It's uh, readily available. We can query. Okay, um, and in our um, so in the next command that we have here that's still running is the describe. So in SQL, uh, we saw that we had to write our own query to generate the max and the min. And in Spark, um, we don't have to uh, do that. We can run the dis describe command, which will generate the, the basic statistics information for us for all the numerical columns. So, um, so yeah, so, um, this usually takes, this should be coming back soon. So um, so the fields that we get are like max, min, uh, the mean, and the standard deviation of the data. Okay. So. Ah, yes, okay. Okay, perfect. So this return uh, perfectly on time. So as I mentioned earlier, we get the mean standard deviation, min and max, but we also get the count information. So again, we can see really quickly the passenger zero and nine that we talked about. Um, 
we have no trip distance in some other area or something that's 800 miles away, which is very, very far. Um, the average distance travel um, is 2.8 miles or 4.5 kilometers. Um, we can see all the Latin longs are, uh, or all the location information are all undefined. So we actually have no information around those four columns. And again, we see that the fair amount is uh, negative and uh, a very large number in the fair amount um, uh, over half a million dollars here. Okay, uh, but our f average fare is only $12.4 and so forth. Um, yep, so those are the, the few columns that I uh, just want to touch on. So um, yeah, so you know, uh, left some comments in our code here um, to explain what's going on. So essentially we we observed the same uh, same issue with the fair amount um, where we have numbers that are less than zero, something that's bigger than a, a thousand. So um, at this point it is important to understand the data that we have. So we go to run um, the normal distribution on this data. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we want to um, we want to find the find the distribution value for um, the 0.15% on the left and the 0.15% on the right of the uh, distribution. So this turned out to be $2.5 and $75. So in our SQL, we would even overshoot that number by, by quite a bit instead of a thousand majority of the number on the right hand side. Uh, um, it's, um, you know, less than it's uh, less than or equal to $75. Okay. Um, yeah, so this, um, so one thing I forgot to cover is um, there's this function called uh, percentile approximate. So this is the um, the function that we call um, in order to achieve that. Um, and this is the the two percent, the two number that I mentioned earlier. So the zero point one five percent, and then the um, pretty much this represents the um, the summations from all the way left to the right. It's the ninety nine point eight five percent, which basically excludes the last zero point one five percent of the data. So all the data in between uh, 2.5 and $75 represents um, our 99.7% uh, percent of our data, which, you know, in statistics term that, you know, basically most of our, not, not all, but like majority of our data. Okay, so, um, so, we, so we can conclude that the negative value and the, any amounts that are bigger than $1,000 in the fair uh, amount are definitely not part of the, the common value or, or the normal value that we should be receiving. Okay, so um, like I said, this is a great starting point for us to find out uh, what the fair amount um, outliers are. Uh, but often in data analysis, uh, including data exploration, we cannot just look at the fair amount itself. Um, it's important to understand that there are different variables that are related to each other. Um, so for example, I would expect to pay a higher fare, a taxi fare, when I go further away, when I travel further. And we can um, we can graph that relationship. Um, so in, in this block of code, um, I'm bringing in a few of the um, additional libraries that I install into the cluster. Um, this includes um, uh, Panda NumPy probably is, you know, out of the box, uh, but I'm also using the matlab.lib uh, library as well. So the Panda um, library, it's it's similar to, to Spark data frame, uh, but it's uh, what we call the Panda data frame. So everything runs basically just on, uh, on one machine instead of on distributed clusters. Uh, NumPy is specifically for um, doing complex array manipulations, so things like linear algebra or matrices. Uh, the matplotlib is the uh, graphing lab library that we use. So, um, so on line 12 here, we 
exclude all the data that we think was not um, was um, in, not not part of the dorm. So in this case, I want to make sure I grab all the data frame data that are between two point five dollars and seventy five dollars, and we store it into a variable called df uh, dq check. Dq stands for data quality, um, and then we convert this into a panda data frame. Now. The reason why I'm using Panda data frame in this case um, is because I want to use a function, a plotting function called scatter matrix. Um, so the scatter matrix functions um, compare each of the column that we have with each other. So this generates um, a matrix of, um, of scatter plot using the matplotlib matplot library. So the more um, column that we pass in, in this case, trip distance and fair amount, uh, if we pass in, a, let's say, a third uh, column, our matrices become three by three instead of two by two, as there's three var variables that we'll be uh, comparing with each other. So, um, yeah, so we can take a look at the quickly on the result here that we have. So we will start with the bottom right. Um, remember, we talked about the, the mean uh, or the average uh, fair amount. Um, and as you can see here, approximately 75% of the, if not more, of the fare are um, less than, or around less than $15, just based on the chart here, which is good, which is kind of what we anticipated, as I think the average was 12.8, uh, we saw up above. Okay, so we'll move to the, um, the bottom left chart as well. Um, and this is showing the trip distance uh, with a fair amount. As we mentioned before, we expect the uh, the further you go, the more the cost would be on, on your trip, right? Um, so the first thing I observe is majority of our trip is probably less than 50 miles, right? I would even say, you know, a little less than that, maybe 40. Um, but looks like trip distance have some issues. So we have a few very low fare amount that are going really far. Um, you know, I would imagine that some of those numbers are, or some of those values are, are, are even outliers, right, for us. Um, so there's more analysis to do um, in order to clean this data up for, uh, to draw any conclusions for our data. Uh, okay, so, but for now, uh, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna assume our data is good um, for the purpose of the presentation. Uh, so it will take a while to kind of go through all the different cleaning steps, but it can be, we can repeat the step um, that we have here for the uh, distance and then basically do the, uh, apply the same logic here in the data quality check. So we assume this data set that we have, um, the DFDQ check is clean now. Uh, the data is properly uh, for 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 detailed analysis or driving any insights um, that we we need, um, and we can expose this data essentially back to the business team if they want, um, so that they can do further analysis on this. And this is one of the uh, powerful thing about um, about uh, Synapse Analytics is both you and uh, any business team that knows SQL can work together. Um, without the need of, uh, of you know, sending data to to another SQL server or, or anything like that. You guys are all working within the same tool. So to do this, um, again, like I mentioned, we'll be creating a link database. Um, so um, we can create in uh, Spark SQL, we can create a database called Data Exploration Spark DB. Um, as you recall earlier in the SQL, we just call it the um, data exploration DB. So there's two, two databases now we have, and we're going to write the, the DQ, the data quality check data that we believe is good into, um, into this database. And the table name we call it is, um, is the TRIP uh, 2019 January clean data. Uh, YL stands for uh, yellow. Uh, just shorthanded that they have to uh, spell everything out. Okay, so uh, so right now I would expect there's a table created already um, in our uh, data tab. Uh, but before we jump over there, I'm going to stop my uh, Spark instance. 
And the reason I'm, I'm doing this is to show that um, we no longer require Spark to run, uh, uh, to access the data in this, um, in this database, okay? So, uh, okay, so the Spark is, uh, session has been stopped. We're gonna navigate back over to the, um, to the workspace. Uh, just go to discard some of the changes I made. So in this way, I can just do a quick refresh here to show everything. Right, I'm just going to open up the SQL database just to show that it's still here, right? We have the source data, and then we have the um, the um, analysis table that we created. Now, in the Lake database, we can see the Spark um, database um, that we created under the tables. Now we have a, a different table. Again, we can come in here and look at the uh, columns. So since this is um, Spark, we see string instead of seeing a, a for char, for example. Okay. So I'm going to bring up um, a second script that I have here. Again, all this script is available in, um, in my GitHub repository. So as you can see here, we're going to uh, first use the uh, data exploration DB. Again, this is the database for uh, that we created in in SQL database. We can select the data from uh, the SQL database like you would expect, right? Uh, but we can also do the same analysis um, that we created this um, uh, analysis uh, table for using the Spark database. We just select it and run. Now, um, what this capability uh, allow you to do is you can actually join the two tables together if you need to. So if someone created um, a clean data uh, external table um, in the SQL database, you know you can easily just join the two um, tables together um, to create additional insights, which uh, otherwise would be more challenging. So we're gonna just do the same quick graph that um, you guys saw earlier. Just to show that everything is the is the same here, okay? Thursday and Wednesday. Now um, the the chart will look slightly different because we actually excluded a lot more data than we did in the first query, right? In the initial query, um, it was uh, the amount is between uh, one dollar to a thousand, I believe. Um, the second one here is two point uh four to um it was 2.5 to 75 dollars so our chart um, looks slightly different but thursday is still um kind of the high point followed by wednesday and i think tuesday kind of all the other they kind of came up a bit in in the uh in the value okay okay so Going to flip back to this slide quickly here. So after all this, uh, we have run through. Um, so we learned that today in data exploration, we have to retrieve data. We need to analyze our data and clean the data ourselves to ensure that we can um, our finding and 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 insights are, are valid. In um, serverless SQL, most of the syntax are the same as traditional SQL. Um, we can create tables and views, as you saw. In Spark SQL, we have a much richer tool and libraries to conduct complex analysis, like the MATLAB uh, library that you saw earlier. Uh, and by creating a lake database, um, we can use serverless SQL to query the data instead of using Spark. Um, in both serverless SQL and serverless Spark, uh, it provides us an easy way to work with our data in the data lake uh, without the, the need to manage our infrastructure. Um, and again, the cost is uh, you pay as you use. Uh, finally, um, all the code again is in my GitHub. Um, and here's a link uh, to the GitHub here. OK, um, so uh, this is the second part of our Q&A session. So I uh, don't see any questions in the chat. Do um, you guys have any questions? Uh, hi, Wilson. This is Ajit again. So, uh, in in terms of uh, you know uh, connecting uh, uh, 
this in case if we want to have this OLTP database in in the Synapse connection, for example, this Cosmos DB, right? So yeah, in case if I have a choice to go for Databricks or Synapse, so I guess uh, Databricks would be my preferred uh, approach in that case. In case if I have to provide the real time insights, um, so you can connect to um, so you can connect to Synapse as well. Uh, Syn uh, not Synapse, sorry, uh, Cosmos DB as well in um in um synapse analytics so that is one of the connectors so today i only show the data lake connector that we have right um again um i just want to separate the two things um you're mentioning um real-time analysis so uh when we do data exploration even though if it's a real time usually uh we don't create the pipeline uh, or we haven't created a pipeline, we just try to assess the data if that's something we would use uh, or that will bring value, right? Um, and it's a good way for us to collaborate with the business groups um, or anyone that only, um, only the teams that are more familiar with SQL and not so much in, in all the other programming languages. Um, where um, I think what you're mentioning, it's more operationalized the, the data pipeline that you have um, so that you can drive meaningful insight that you already discovered previously, right? Yeah, I mean, even even if I have to go for the Spark structure, structure streaming, right? Uh, I mean, uh, once the data is coming from the IoT Hub and I want, I want, I want to read the data directly, right? And and, and then process it in, in uh, through, the, through, I would say, machine learning model. Then uh, I guess uh, Databricks uh, would be my, I'm not sure about it because right now uh, we are doing it based on the Databricks only. Uh, we are hesitant to go for synapse i don't know why but uh, you know when it comes to synapse we we are primarily using it for uh, data warehouse and right. some uh, sometimes it's like you know as i said uh, uh, predictive analysis on our data warehouse then uh, since uh, as uh, i feel like uh, data need not to move from again from uh, synapse to databricks for predictive analysis so um, yeah, definitely. I agree with you on that. Um, so in Azure, you will be using Azure ML. If you really need to go to the full-blown predictive analytics. Um, there is some uh, capability in Synapse to do that. Um, I think we have to be mindful about um, the uh, operationalizing our insights versus exploring uh, for our insights. So um, a lot of um, from my experience, a lot of company, what they do is if they're so focused on data breaks, the question is how do we get the business involved in exploring the data? Um, do we want the business to be end up using Proton, which if we're to clip the customer up is relatively expensive. Um, and, and what is our alternative if we don't? Do we want the business group to be using Spark SQL, which we will have problem doing joint? Uh, or like a lot of joints that we, you know, can take a lot of time. Um, so how do we get around that that problem, right? Um, so we we have to be very prescriptive in terms of um, we separate the data pipeline we need to build versus the um, exploration that we got to do for the business and you know and ourselves. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, so listen, uh, on the quick note, like, you know, the as a continuous part that when we work upon the uh, data and the uh, modeling, I mean, like prediction of the model. So can we use the data, uh, this Azure Synapse to store the features, may help as the feature store, like a SQL light in GCP? Is it possible to do because the data lake with that your data comes from the source to it captured right. from there it connect to the database so that could be the good functionality can i consider here yeah yeah that's a good question um so i think um as a foundation um since all the data um should be stored in the data lake somehow right um so with that mindset um you can use you know data breaks you can use um synapse to access your data so i don't think there is um i, I don't think there's a limitation on either solution you're going to pick uh in terms of storing your feature set um so i'm i'm more of an opinion storing you know your your data always in the data lake before you make it available and kind of this is kind of what the demo is showing is we always access the data from the data lake uh first uh before we do anything else with it Okay, how is the connection to the data bricks to Synapse? So 
does it have any uh, uh, inbuilt flow with that because when i see the data breaks it has a data lack and pipeline and the that service id and the connection approach so how it is going to connect to the synapse so synapse is completely different service from the database right uh so the service is uh different correct but um you we should always um go through the data lake so what i mean by that is when you want to build all your feature set, a feature set and if you want to make that um, feature set available for the business, for example, um, you should write that out into the data lake first. And then um, in Synapse, you can create, let's say, external table, which will expose that data uh, um, out to you know, either engineering or, or to the business group. So that's how I would um, I would design that solution. Um, by all means, it is not, it is not um, uh as straightforward as everything in data breaks or everything in synapse but yeah, yeah you know if yeah. that's what we need to do then then that's the middle ground um, that's, uh, that's the right point you raised here so i believe that synapse is basically for the data engineering task like where we work with the spark mechanism which captures the data transform the data into streamline from the different yeah. sources and uh, i feel like data flex comes to you know connect with the underlying thing that connect from the data lake as a source and will capture their data and to be used as a model uh, so, okay. So, yeah, no problem. So, I just want to expand on one point that you asked there. So, um, I have seen many companies trying to uh, put a third normal form or transactional data into the data warehouse and exposing it into Power BI and expecting that to work. Uh, this is something we'll cover in the next section uh, session, uh, um, probably in in a, in a month time or so on data warehousing. Um, and that's not really how Synapse yeah. or, or a lot but of But data, data warehousing is not like a traditional database box, right? Data warehousing right. and data lake is completely different picture. Yeah. So let's say if you want on the data warehouse, like, you know, if you're capturing the data from the source, like the database and the function data lake is exactly at the storage, the data and capturing the queries. It's normal how Athena you're accessing through the AWS. So data lake has a more feasibility to work when working with the the model and data engineering yeah that's um, my I, I think it's yeah. I, I think it's not all or the other so uh, an example i want to say is you might need to do reporting on the feature that you generate and the output that you predict and this um uh and this part of the um, of the design work if you will might require data modeling for the data warehousing regardless if that's a, a streaming solution or if that's a batch solution so I don't think it's uh, it's all or nothing. I think it's um, in the in the playground of data and AI, they all kind of come hand to hand together. Um, so even in the case, you know, like you mentioned, the uh, the feature set that you got to generate, you might generate that in Databricks, but you might need to do reporting uh, on the set feature set and the and the predictive outcome. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, any more questions? Hey, Wilson. Um, thanks for having this. I have a quick question. Um, so basically, I'm also coming from a Databricks background. So I'm here to understand how Synapse is similar or different from Databricks. And one thing that I wanted to understand is the pricing aspect. So when I, whenever I spin up a cluster in Databricks, I see a DB estimate for that. Uh, for the pricing aspect, but then um, I did not see uh, anything similar in Synapse. Uh, just wondering, is there a way we could get an estimate for the same? Uh, Sorry, talking about your... that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so there he is. So um, there is the pricing calculator, which um, I won't bring up at the point, but there is a uh, a synapse pricing calculator in for all the Azure product. There's an Azure calculator for that. Um, but um, this is the part that um, um, that I said earlier. It might take a little while to stand up. Is the is the pool that we got to um, create. So in here we can see the estimate pricing, the different type of um, node size that we have. Um, I believe GPU is also um, in public in, in a preview um, from the documentation. So that would be coming soon. Um, so yeah, so all this configuration, there's a pricing guideline here as well. That makes sense. Thanks, and this is this going to be available even if I spin up Spark Pool or uh, uh, the serverless SQL uh, 
pool. Right. So pool. this is for this is for the Spark pool that you saw here, right, in this screen. Um, so for the SQL pool, um, there is no configuration. So when you create synapse, this is your um, serverless pool, and the um, and the cost. It's really just based on how much you run and and the. Uh, um, how long your query takes, and that's all done through the Azure calculator. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and don't forget, similar to um, um, Databricks in Azure, or I imagine AWS, um, you can also buy reserve units for them. So um, all this number you see here excludes any um, enterprise agreements and any reserve units that you purchase. Yeah. Uh, so Jet has another question. Any benefits Synapse provide to RWT uh, while reading large files? Um, so in generally speaking, no. Uh, now I'm not a. I do not know. You know. Uh, all the optimization that happens between data breaks and in Synapse. Um, uh, with respect to, uh, yeah, I don't know all the details in terms of um, what optimization Azure has done in the in the Spark pool versus what optimization Databricks has done in their in their Spark. So that's kind of preparatory to to each of the software. So I cannot say, but generally speaking, they both built out of the Spark. So not um, not exactly. You can uh, do much uh, much differences in performance. Um, now it is. You know, uh, again, I just want to go back to to the benefit of um, of the synapse here is because you have one tool for both you and and the different departments, business department to use. Um, so this might be not a performance enhancement that you get, but more of a collaboration benefit that you will get. Okay. Sorry, my mouse is going a little weird today. Um, yeah, so everyone can access all the data here, so no problem. Okay, any more questions? Uh, Wilson, Fiaz here again. Um, Hi. Uh, so I'm looking at this workspace, and this reminds me more of ADF again. I was wondering if Synapse also has integration runtimes working in the background, like it does for. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah. So, so this whole integration piece is very similar to um, ADF. Um, so there is uh, integration runtime that can, um, you know, that can um, that is used for our data pipeline. Um, now there is some differences between ADF and. Uh, synapse, um, for example, the self-host integrated integration one time, um, I believe there are some differences. Um, some connectors are not all working in Synapse uh, quite yet, from my understanding. Um, I don't have all the breakdown in the detail, but um, if you search up the Synapse um, documentation, you will show that there is um, uh, between Synapse and uh, Data Factory. Uh, you should get a result that shows all the differences as I don't recall all the differences that they have. So, so we cannot share the integration one time, for example, quite yet in Synapse. This is helpful. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, no problem. A quick follow up question. Um, no, of course. Say, for example, we have spun up a Spark tool uh, cluster in Synapse. There's going to be anyhow charged for that. Are are we going to be charged for the integration runtime as well? Um, good question. Um, no, so um, it depends on your usage. So um, as you recall, uh, um, in one of our ADF sessions, we talk about using um, Azure Data Factory to trigger Databricks uh, uh, jobs, right? Or in this case, we can trigger uh, Synapse jobs. Um, so in that case, um, there might be integration involvement and uh, a Spark pool involvement. 
uh, but when in our demo, when we're doing um, just running the script as is, um, that's all done in um, when we're running our notebook as is, that's all in the um, Spark pool charges. There's no charges to the integration runtime. Thank you. Okay, uh, any more questions? Uh, how do we connect with you your further questions in case yeah so um feel free to connect with me uh like i mentioned earlier in in the slide deck uh you can find me um on linkedin on um c shop corner or even uh, at um github so uh, feel free to connect and uh we can answer any more questions on one of those three channels as well